If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. In other words, when it comes to time, it's use it or lose it. And how we use time determines whether we become an investment, whether it, be, whether it becomes an investment, or simply used up for this life only. Jesus said we are to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. When we use our time to do that, when we make God's work a priority in the use of our time, we are making a wise investment that will pay eternal dividends. Harvey Mack can put it this way. It can happen. It takes commitment. It takes believing in yourself even when no one else does. It takes aggressive action. It takes a thick skin. It takes an endless amount of drudgery and plain hard work. It takes a long, long time. But if someone else can do it, someone else is doing it. Every minute of the day, so can you. Mackey was speaking of the business of selling envelopes. What he said, though, applies to very well to accomplishing great things for God through the wise use of our time. Think about it. If someone else can do it, someone else is doing it. Every minute of the day, and so can you. All right, let's go to the Lord and our call to worship in unison, please. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Each day it belongs to us in new opportunities to learn and grow. God is near to all of us. We will not fear to call upon the Lord. Come, let us praise God who walks with us daily. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God who loves and lives with us. Amen. Our opening song is Holy, 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 number 47.
Gracious God, we confess, we confess before you our sins. We have we sinned against each other and against you. you. We have judged our brothers and sisters for the way they look, their clothes, their words. We have turned our way from those who are hurting and hungry. We have forgotten that we are to be your hands and feet. Turn our hearts to you, God. Forgive our sins and pray. Amen. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As he hung on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Thank you, Lord, for being our forgiving Savior. Amen. Our songs of worship are great is thy faithfulness and living hope.
And we can have the hope and the power of the resurrection to live out each day. So as we learn this new song, or if you know it and sing along, uh, let's do so. It's called Living Hope.
That was wonderful. Uh, it's time for our tithes and offerings. As you know, the plates are in the back of the room. We appreciate everyone's faith in the mission that's uh, being carried on here. Let me pray. Generous Father, thank you that all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things, and in you all things exist. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouse, and that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down blessing upon blessing. Accept the gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives, the love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of God uphold us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
God, that she is with you. She's in the arms of her Savior. Lord, for that our hearts are happy. For that we rejoice. Father, I want to pray for those that are struggling some way, either in relationships, they want something more fulfilling in a certain relationship or something that's stuck. Pray for that. Some God finances are tight. We pray because you're a God of provision that you'll provide for them. Lord, I today pray for the sad. There's some here that are sad at heart and maybe behind that, that small, small smile is a sad heart for some reason. And I ask God that you come and bring your cheer. I pray your Holy Spirit would go to the root of that sadness. That you would remind them that you're with them and you love them. And for that, we can have a happy heart. And I pray for the lonely, and I feel called to pray for the lonely today, those that are missing someone, or, or they're just at a place in life where they don't feel connected for some reason. I pray for the lonely at heart, that you'd come alongside of them, that you would be uh, the one that they recognize will never leave, and that you'll never forsake them. And I pray you'd bring people alongside of them and encourage them. We pray now, Lord, for those, uh, uh, for ourselves and for those that we love. In this time of silence, we pray, God, that you will hear us. I know that you will. I pray we can just talk to you right now and listen to you in silence. Thank you, Lord, for this sweet hour of prayer that we can have together and we can have any time in our home. Thank you, Lord. Lord, now we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, the Lord's Prayer, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we have been in the book of Mark uh, since the beginning of the year up to Easter. We covered uh, those chapters uh, in, the, in that book. Not every chapter, but many of the, the passages of Jesus' ministry, of teaching and healing and ministry. So we are going to start, just for three weeks, a new series on our mission statement of what, that, of what we're about here at Mount Olivet. And I'm looking forward to that. We're going to start in today with the first part of that. Let me go ahead and pray. Lord, we've been gathered in fellowship, we've been gathering together, Lord, we've gathered uh, to sing, Lord, we've gathered this morning to pray, Lord, now we gather around your word. We pray, Lord, that you give us understanding, pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So, a mission statement. A mission statement gives the primary purpose of an organization or a company. It, it says what it's about. It says what it's its purpose, what is its place in the world, what it's going to do. So what I want to do is have some fun. I'm going to put some mission statements of organizations or companies up on the screen, and I want you to guess what that company or group is, okay? 
So here's the first one. I read this: to be Earth's most customer-centric company, where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online, and endeavors to offer its customers the lowest possible prices. What company do you think that is? Amazon. Well, oh, you're good. Amazon. Great job. Find and discover anything. How about this one? To organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. Google, great job, two for two. Okay, how about this one? We save money, we save people money so they can live better. How about this one? <laughs> Walmart, good job, good job. How about this one? And this is for those who like a, another company here, besides Walmart. As the pioneer of the one-stop shopping concept, we offer excellent customer service, low prices, quality food, and a broad selection of national and brand items. Who is that? General Jones? Tim would know. Meyer! All right. Well, this one, to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies, by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Red Cross. Good, American Red Cross. I haven't fooled anybody. Again, here's one that's a little tougher. There's one key word that makes it stand out. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. Starbucks. One cup at a time, they're going to transform lives. <laughs> <laughs> Creating happiness through magical experiences. It's Disney. 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 I should have gone a lot harder. You guys got all of them. How about this one? Seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. There's Mount Olivet with Steve's fantastic flagpole. Wonderful, great job. Seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. That's what we want to be about. That's our mission statement here at Mount Olivet. And I want to walk through it today. It's on our website. If, if you're new and you want to learn a little bit more about who we are as a church, or even if you've been here and you want to see, okay, this is what we believe. These are some core beliefs. This is who we are. Here's some opportunities for ministry we can be involved with. Uh, check those out, but this is our mission statement, and I want to walk through it, and we're going to do that the next three weeks, because there's three parts of it, and we're going to especially focus on seeking God today, but I want to real quickly in the beginning just walk through those three, those three points of seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. So seeking God is the first one. Here's our main passage today, and we'll come back to it after we review that. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. So we are to seek God as God reveals himself to us. God wants to be found and he wants to be known. As he shows up, we know him and glorify him and love him because we're seeking him. Listen to these other verses on seeking God. There's several, especially in the Old Testament. Here's just a couple. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in strength and seek his face always. Or Psalm 27, 8 says, My heart says if you seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. Psalm 40, 16, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your great saving help always say, the Lord is great. Or this one in Psalm 53, 2. God looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. So God is looking for those who seek him. And God He's desiring, he's looking, he wants to find churches that are seeking him. And so while we as individuals and while we as Mount Olivet be a seeking church, we're going to come back to seeking God in a moment. I'm just going to talk about sharing life, sharing life together. 
Here's Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We must also consider how to encourage each other to show love and to do good things. We should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as they see the day of the Lord approaching. And so we're to be about a community. We're to share lives with one another in authentic ways and to be real, to fellowship and encourage one another, to spur one another on to good deeds. And we're to be about growing in maturity, just not community, but we're to grow together and to gather around the word together outside of Sundays. We'll be talking about that next week, how to be in a small group and to live out a community of faith together. And thirdly, we're to serve others. Each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That's 1 Peter 4.10. Well, here's Mark 9, 33 to 35. And Jesus and the disciples are coming into Capernaum, and they're arguing about who's the greatest. Remember that story? Who's the greatest? Sitting down, Jesus called the 12, Mark 9, 35. And says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. That's how we serve one another. We go out as a church and we go out as individuals and we serve. We meet practical needs and physical needs and emotional needs of people. We live out the gospel through our deeds. And we live out our gospel of Jesus Christ. We live that gospel out by sharing the good news. That life is found truly and ultimately in Jesus Christ. We tell people that there's no true lasting joy outside of God. There's happiness in a good job. There's happiness in a fulfilling relationship or a new car or a vacation. Those things are good. They bring happiness. But they can be fleeting, can't they? It's only relationship with Christ that we want to share with people because his love lasts for eternity and people last for eternity. Only Jesus and people will be rescued off this earth. So here's our mission. We're going to talk about seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. And you can remember this. I want us to remember this by doing a little exercise. Seeking God. We'll do this with our hands. Seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. We've got morning calisthenics here, don't we? Exercise. Seeking God, sharing life, and serving others. That's what we want to be about. So here's our mission. Here's where we're going with our, our message this morning. And it's seeking God. Let me read that passage again. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. So for David, who writes this song, the shepherd king David, there are three parts of seeking. There's three ways to seek, three things that come about as we seek. And first, it's personal. Look at this first, this first part of this verse. It says, you, God, are my God. You, God, are my God. David's developed a personal relationship with God. It's, God isn't just a God up there looking down. God's not just a force, not Star Wars, the force be with you. It's God's personal. He says, you're my God. He knows him. He's felt his presence. He's experienced the presence of God. David has experienced the fact that, that God has protected him. That God has provided for him. God's giving his, his very presence to him. And so for you, God wants to be your God. You can say, God is my God. Can you say that? God is my God. As we come to a place of acceptance of Jesus Christ in our hearts as Savior and Lord, he promises to come into our hearts, forgive us our sin, draw us to himself, and walk with us the rest of our days. That's a good deal. Okay, that's a great deal. 
That's the good news. That's the great news. God walks with you. He talks with you. The Lord listens to you. We're in a conversation with God. He's my God. He gives you his grace and his strength. He's near you as a sojourner in this life, as you walk on this journey of faith. That's who God is. David says, God, you are my God. So some come close to the Lord. Talk and relate. Spend time with God in prayer and in the word on your own and together in the company of others as the church to discover who God was. Julian of Norwich was an English woman. She was a mystic, and she lived in the 14th century. And she writes this in her work called Showings. The soul's unrelenting search pleases God. To seek with faith, hope, and love pleases our Lord. And finding pleases the soul and fills it with joy. God wants us to continue to seek him until we see him. And it is by that very means that he shows himself to us as a special grace when he wills it. So seeking God is personal. It glorifies God and it satisfies our soul like nothing else. So seeking of God is personal. Here's the, the, the next thing as we walk through this passage. Seeking of God is intentional. Look at this. Earnestly, I seek you. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. So there's intentionality and intensity in this seeking of God. It's not small. It's huge. David goes after God hard. He goes after the heart of God. Earnestly, it says, he's pursuing God, and so can we. When we get up in the morning, Lord, I seek you. I want to see your face. I want to know your presence. I go after you hard. I seek your face and your presence and your lordship and your guidance and your direction, your very self. You is who I seek today. And what that Old Testament word seek means is not just about thinking about God, but it's an active engagement with God. You're investigating who God is. You're praying about it. You're acting on it. You're painstakingly diligent to seek the Lord. It's the focus of your attention. It's the yearning of your heart. Earnestly, I seek you. I want to tell you about a guy I knew in college. His name was Jerry. And I knew Jerry, Susan and I knew him, through a campus ministry we were a part of. And Jerry uh, was seeking God. He was a philosophy major. And so he was a deep thinker, and he read a lot. And he was seeking truth. And a moment came in his seeking through the gospel and the word and the sharing of it with him that he became a Christian. He was an atheist at first and he came to Christ. And I'll tell you, he had such a ravenous appetite for God. He, he sought God now as a Christian. And one of the things that Jerry did is he wanted to memorize the book of Romans. Okay, now Romans... <laughs> is 16 chapters. It's 433 verses. It's almost 9,500 words. I don't know if he got through it, but had, that was his goal when he started to memorize the book of Romans. I mean, I did well, I don't know about you, I did well to memorize just a few sprinkling of verses in, in Romans and a, and a few verses of the Bible. He wanted to seek and to know and to love and to, to fall deeper into relationship with Christ. I will never forget Jerry. I'll never forget him. It says, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land is what David writes. He actually sang this song. It's a piece of the word of God. Dry land. It, the Old Testament word it, uh, like it says, means parched. It means a wilderness. And it's exactly the kind of place that David was at the time. It was either one of two places. He was uh, on the run from King Saul who was trying to take him out because he was jealous that David would become king. And he was jealous that he was more popular with the people than him. Or it was him fleeing from Absalom who was his son who had rebelled and was trying to take his life. And he's in 
the wilderness. He's in an arid land, and he realized it was also a metaphor for his own soul that was dry and parched and longing for something larger than himself. And throughout Scripture, wilderness is a powerful symbol of God's presence. See, the world promises to meet your needs and to quench your thirst. That's its promise to you and me. It promises to fill us when our souls are hungry for meaning, purpose, and happiness. The world promises to meet your needs through material things and money and achievements and activities and the successes of your kids. We promises, the world promises to satisfy you. But David says he seeks God. He says, God is life. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you. See, we can seek the gifts of happiness and finances or peace or contentment or fulfilling relationships. We can seek, and all those are good, we can seek the gifts, or you can seek the giver. Amen. You can seek the gifts of God to satisfy your hearts, or you can seek the one who gives them. And God is the only one who's going to satisfy your soul fully. Now, I just want to say one thing, that you may be thinking, does God seek me, or do I seek God? Well, I think it's both. In the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, of which Mount Olivet is, um, there's the emphasis that God initiates, that he seeks us. He takes the initiative that, and draws us and woos us and calls us into relationship. It's irresistible grace that calls us to a relationship with Christ. And that's true. Without God's intervening, we don't naturally seek after God. Now here's the thing. Listen to this verse, Psalm 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. So it's saying that there's a seeking on our part too, somewhat in salvation, but certainly after that as we live out our life in Christ. Somehow those two subjects of seeking, God seeking us and us seeking God, come together. Say to God, I seek you, and God will reveal himself to you, and, and he wants to be found. Remember when you're a kid, you played hide and seek? I always like to be the one that, that hid. Because you look like for the hardest place to go. Right, because you don't want anybody to find you. You want to like keep them guessing and searching for you for, for a long time. Well, here's the thing. God doesn't play hide and seek with you. He wants to be found. God wants to be discovered and loved and adored and known. He wants to be found by you. He wants you to be he wants to be found so that you can come into a relationship as he seeks you and you seek him. That he comes and he shows you what true life is. He invites you into that relationship with him where we're rescued from our sin and brought into a glorious, joy-filled relationship. C.S. Lewis was a British professor of literature and history at Cambridge and Oxford. That's like our Harvard and Yale. So he was a smart guy. Those that went there, those men and women were pretty smart. And he was a former, did you know this? C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of, of Narnia, so many books, was a contemporary of Tolkien. He was an atheist to start. He was not this, this wonderful Christian man. I mean, he was wonderful, but he was not a Christian. He was an atheist. And he comes to faith. He writes, continue seeking God with all seriousness, unless he wanted you you would not be wanting him. God wants you in a relationship, to know you and to be known. And there's intensity in the seeking. He says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. There's this thirst in this statement. Now, in our mission statement, I was thinking about this. You could, we could have used several different words. Instead of seeking God, we could have used Loving God. Loving God. Hebrews 6, 5, and again, Jesus says in Luke 10, 27, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your strength, right? That's the first and greatest commandment. So it could be loving God. It could be knowing God. There's churches and mission organizations that have this uh, mission statement, to know God and to make him known. That's really good. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 8 to 11, says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. For knowing Christ, there is no greater thing than their surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So we could have used knowing, could have used glorifying God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession. But we're going to use seeking because I think in the order of things it comes first. We seek God, then you know God, then you love God, then you glorify God. Think about it. That's the order. Seeking God, and as we seek, as he reveals himself to us, and as we find him, there's now a knowing of God. And now there's a loving of God, and there now is a glorifying and praising of God. See the order? So that, that, that's why we're saying that about all of that, seeking God. To so see that God, seeking him is personal. See that seeking God is intentional. And lastly, see that God is experiential. We go into this at verse 2. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. He sees the power and glory of God. David sought God in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary there means the tabernacle. The temple had not been built yet. Solomon would build that. He seeks God in the tabernacle, in this physical place. That's what sanctuary is referring to. But more than that, where is David right now? He's in the wilderness. And so it's not a physical place. It's a spiritual concept. It's a place to be entered in, not as a physical place. It can be entered in by faith no matter where a person was. And it said he had seen God and beheld God. And you and I can see see God and behold him for all that God is, for all his character, for all his attributes. Like we said before we sang Holy of Holies, for his compassion and kindness and patience and goodness and his faithfulness in our life, for his holiness, we see him and behold him, his power and glory. David didn't just read about God in the commands and the record of the Old Testament. He, he he knew God, and it's the same with us. And we can read and we can listen in a Sunday school or through a message that the preacher has. We can learn about some facts about God, and that's good. But that's not seeing and beholding with the eyes of our heart. So read the word and hear the word, and you will see as you seek him. Pray, and it will lead to seeing. Minister up to others and you will see the Lord work. Allow the Lord to minister to your heart and to heal you and to make you whole and to restore brokenness and to deliver you and me from darkness and oppression and to die on a cross that we might know him. And it ends with this verse, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. So as we see and behold God, we'll see that he loves us deeply. He loves you extravagantly. He calls you, if you and I could ever grasp that, you will never be the same. He calls you the beloved of God. He calls you a beloved daughter and son of God. You are the beloved of God. And there's no more wonderful identity to have. Say to God, I want to experience you because there's nothing better in life that's offered in life itself in Christ. Say to God, I want to experience you. I want to experience you, not just to know you in my head, but to know you in my heart. Not just to know facts that like, uh, he was born, that he lived and had a ministry of, of serving others. Not just that he died on a Roman cross and was raised again. Not that just he, he lives now by his Holy Spirit in and through us. But to know him to see him in a worship experience through his word and in prayer and through nature and through the arts and through music. That we can experience God. It's an experiential thing. 
This is the experience of seeking God and His glory. I end with this quote. This is wonderful. I think it's really good. If you're sincerely seeking God, God will make His existence evident to you. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek Him, the greatest adventure. And to find Him, the greatest human achievement. And do you want real adventure in life? Seek God. Say to God, I seek you. I seek you with all my heart. Your ways and your will. Lord, here at Mount Olivet, we're going to seek you. We're going to seek you in our worship service. We're going to seek you at home. We're going to seek you what's your will for us as we reach out to Trenton and the surrounding, surrounding communities. We're going to seek you. Don't settle. Hear this. Don't settle for small and insignificant adventures. Don't settle for that. It will never satisfy. Go after God and seek the Savior through faith and fervor. Seek evidence and experience, and you will be with God, and life will never be the same. For those of you who know Him already, you know what? Whatever your age, for how long ever you have known Him as a Christian, there's always more to discover about God, about all His attributes. Amen. There's always more. No matter if you're younger or in the middle or older, however you know you have known Christ, keep seeking, no matter your age. And you will do that, you will glorify God, and you will have your soul satisfied. Amen. Lord, we seek you. We want to know you. We want to glorify you. Show us how to do that. Show us and reveal more of yourself to us. More every day, more revelation of who you are and who we are in Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we were looking for a song to, to end on. John and I talked, or we text, or email this week. What are we going to end on? And we thought of this song, Be Thou My Vision. The words go, go wonderfully with this passage from Psalm. So let's stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision.